Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides should be celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a size-inclusive bike community. So join your hosts. I'm Maggie. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies, but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Marley. Welcome back to another episode of All Bodies on Bikes. Uh, Really excited for today's guest. Uh, I got to meet her at Steamboat Gravel last year and just felt like this immediate kinship with her. Um, So it's been really fun to follow her adventures over the past, not quite year, um, but just follow along on the internet because she's been up to some really, really cool things. Um, So let's go ahead and read her bio. How's that sound? Perfect. Do you want me to read it? Tell me all about her. I'll I'll read it. You you tell me all about her. Okay. Um, So Olivia Frankie uh, uses she, her pronouns, and she's a biracial Chicana who is passionate about social justice, advocacy for inclusion in cycling, plants, and her two cats. She was born in Portland, Oregon, but is proud to call, I'm going to say this totally wrong, Denai, is that how you say it? Denaina. Denina, thank you. Denina lands in Anchorage, Alaska, home now. She works in community education at a nonprofit called Native Movement and also spends time working in community with other cyclists to organize and facilitate BIPOC affinity rides in Anchorage. She considers herself to still be a novice cyclist, having just gotten into bikepacking, winter rides on frozen bodies of water, and cycling with groups. She was a 2022 Ride for Racial Justice team member at Steamboat Gravel. For Olivia, the bike is a vehicle for liberation. Her identities as queer, larger bodied, BIPOC, adopted, and femme. They are all made free and celebrated when she is having fun and pushing herself on a bike. I'm so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, Olivia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, and I this is kind to of say good morning, but I think it's <laughs> afternoon where you are. It's afternoon where I'm at, but you're in Alaska, right? This, we have guests two weeks in a row from Alaska, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How are things up in Alaska this week? They're good. Oh my gosh, they're sunny, and it's uh, the time of year where like the sun actually has a little bit of warmth. It's still very cold out, to be clear, but if you're walking outside and you're like pausing in the sun, your face might feel a little warm. So oh. things are turning turning around. Nice. I love that feeling. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> and it's funny, I, I don't get it much in Arkansas anymore because it's we've had like 70 degree days in January and, you know, spring is in full on oh. bloom here. But I remember living in Seattle and it was like, you get that little peak of sunshine and it's like, oh my God, I'm alive. Like, this is, this is what it feels like. It's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. <laughs> and I live in the South where we just complain about it, whatever it's doing whatever the weather is it's too wet or it's too hot or something i know and and i'm wearing sandals it's weird oh my gosh but pretty soon it'll be too hot and too humid and exactly so we'll take why is it always raining what was that olivia i said then you'll just have to come to alaska exactly for biking Yeah. Um, Well, let's talk about Alaska. Um, So you're from Portland, but you live in Alaska now. Did your cycling um, career or journey, did that start in Alaska? Uh, It restarted in Alaska is what I would say. A rebirth. Um, So yeah, I grew up in Portland and I grew up and I did not have a car until I was like 23. I was about to move to Idaho. That was the only reason I got a car. Um, so I grew up biking, but it was not like a joyful, like goal oriented experience. It was like, I need to get to this babysitting gig at five in the morning. So I'm going to bike. So I biked a ton in Portland and then like did not bike at all during grad school and moving between Idaho and Alaska for a few years. And then once I was resettled back here in Alaska and was like, I'm building my life, I got back into cycling and it's been a joy. It's a joy filled biking journey now 
And I know that you do a lot of different kinds of biking. Um, you know, we said in your bio, we talked about gravel. We talked about fat biking. Um, sounds like you've done some commuting. Do you have a favorite kind of biking? It's really hard for me to decide right now because I still feel so new to all of those disciplines. I I do really like gravel. It is a hard to find here in Alaska specifically. So there's really only so much that I can kind of like train for or advance towards in the gravel world um but i also really like mountain biking um i'm really scared of it right now because i had a crash last year but as far as like moving through technical routes and like single speeding or not single speeding i'm sorry no single track riding <laughs> not single speed unfortunately um single track i just like i like that part um that can also be difficult to find in alaska just as far as like beginner stuff interesting that beginner stuff that beginner stuff is hard to find everywhere i feel like because people call things beginner and then you get out there and you're like who's beginning because this is not my beginner yeah no 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 (laughs) (laughs) i want a toddler trail please yeah um how did you get into gravel if there's not too much around you How, how did that start Actually, the main motivation was uh, training for Steamboat. So I got accepted into Ride for Racial Justice, and that was like, I say that it was a little bit of a surprise, but obviously, like, I was fully consenting and applying and, like, doing the whole process. But it was a a surprise to get in, and then from there, it was like, oh, yeah, how do I train for this here specifically? It's a lot of, like, paved greenway riding for, like, the endurance aspect of it. And we tend to get like (laughs) pea gravel on our paved greenways from all of the gravel that gets poured down on the snow in the winter. So it's like gravel-y. But then there are some like opportunities, like if you go up to Denali National Park or Wrangell St. Elias, there are some like long gravel roads more north of where I'm at. And so if you like are ready to seek them out, you can find them, but yeah the main motivation was steamboat and then that experience just I loved it it was so fun and like such a good day and that is really what it's like I want to just have long sunny even not sunny like rainy days but like long ones on my bike exploring these country roads like yeah I just love that feeling and so I may have to do a lot of traveling to get a lot more of that (laughs) I've heard that the Dalton Highway is a, a long road that has a lot of gravel. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I've also heard that that is a very intense bike ride. <laughs> I have also heard that. I, I'm not necessarily suggesting it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it does check a few of the boxes you were looking for. <laughs> totally. Oh, my gosh. I think, like, five-year five year goal, maybe. Um, I have a I have a this year goal of going even farther into Denali National Park because that was incredible last year. We did 22 miles one night bike packing and yeah, the road is closed to like general public after a certain point. And so you have like the touring buses that are going into the park. But other than that, there's really no traffic on that gravel road and there's plenty of climbing and plenty of descents and just I mean obviously it's Denali it's like stunning landscapes that it's you're kind of pretty there. so it's like it's all right I guess <laughs> it'll do <laughs> that sounds like a dream um yeah. it's funny you mentioned Wrangell St. Elias and I have mm-hmm. no I, I think I was just on Instagram a couple years ago and I came across the Wrangell St. Elias National Park Instagram and became obsessed with it um mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is prior to all bodies on bikes becoming a thing but I actually like was probably like two days away from going to work in a lodge there for the summer and my partner at the time was like are you gonna have a conversation with me about this or are you just oh. disappearing and so I didn't end up going um but it's still on my list of places to uh to spend some time yeah I've never been um like I've yeah I've never been I've driven past the road that you turned on but I've heard just incredible things about biking that road so uh, we were actually just talking to one of my friends uh yesterday about her driving sack wagon and us biking and like yeah so she would like set up camp every night and we would just bike to that point and meet her and I'm hoping that that happens this summer I like that invite me because that sounds like a dream 
Oh, yeah, yeah, we will. <laughs> Road trip to Alaska, but via the sky. Yeah. Something, yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, words. I say words sometimes. <laughs> well, you, you did Steamboat last year. Hey. You did You did a lot of big things last year. Tell us about the things from last year. Man, did I do a lot of big things? I did a lot of stuff on my bike. I loved it. Um, a lot of bike think, things then. Lots of lots of bike <laughs> things. Yeah. Um, Steamboat's probably like the the biggest, and uh, that was in August. But leading up to that, like training wise, yeah. and I don't know what to talk about. Whether it's like bike or biking or all of it, but I'm gonna touch on all of it a little bit. So do that. Go. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, and yeah, 2022 <laughs> in a year, like. <laughs> Got accepted to ride for racial justice in January, and um, I think this is a story that a lot of people have like heard at least bits and pieces of. But got accepted, and then this bike project started happening. Where the it's a completely donated bike. I talk about it a lot. It's the main like story for some of my like storytelling uh, projects. But the bike got built. It's completely donated by lots of different industry partners and orgs. And so through that process, there was a lot of learning about like some of the more like nitty gritty, like what goes on a bike and like, how do you make decisions about which headset you want or which handlebars or like, where do you want your seat or what kind of seat do you want? And so lots of like learning there. And that was a big process that I really loved. We built the bike and then I trained in Denali. So I think that was like one of my big, rides last year was that yeah. training ride. um that was the first time on like a bike that was meant for gravel that was like meant for my body too so mm. I went into Nolly like super nervous because it's a ton of climbing and that's my least developed skill set right now and just having the right bike was incredible um and luckily that was a positive experience I could see myself totally freaking out because that was two weeks before steamboat maybe is when I actually got the bike in my hands so things went well and then we traveled to Colorado and I raced in steamboat um as a part of Ride for Racial Justice I did the green route which at the time was my longest day on a bike ever heck yeah I think 39 miles uh yeah. still like biking to the start line so <laughs> maybe 40 42 miles whatever um yeah, so that was August, and then, of course, because of who I am, I immediately was like, what's my next big thing, and <laughs> planned the bikepacking route in October, um, and biked with the frame builder who built that bike, so yeah. I know that was a little bit long, but it was important to bring that back to, like, the big bike trip in October that happened was to, like, actually bike with my frame builder, which was, like, an unreal experience, and uh yeah there was that and then the winter the winter slows me down personally a bunch um I'm still finding my groove with fat biking and winter biking in Alaska so yeah but there were yeah there were lots of good highlights there from last year um it was a big year for sure yeah and I missed part of this because I had to deal with my dogs um <laughs> did you mention Chingona as part of what I happened in the past year okay <laughs> let's talk but about that yeah. <laughs> the bike and the project uh yeah um Absolutely. let's talk about the bike first so the the name of the bike is chingona yeah yeah i've named her chingona which means badass yes. woman in spanish um and yeah and she is she's fucking badass i don't know if i can cuss i'm sorry oh you can <laughs> bring it on before we were even a podcast we had the explicit rating and i was like well Okay, I guess that works. <laughs> Something about the title. <laughs> that seems right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's. I'm also like looking over my shoulder because she's on my trainer right now. Yeah. So I named it's, her Chingona because of that connection of like helping me embody that a little bit on a bike. So. Is it a steel bicycle? Is it aluminum, carbon? What are we talking? It is steel. Um, yeah, it's steel. 
and a man named Stephen Wood made it. Uh, Wood out of Richmond, Virginia, and he like hand builds frames in his garage, which is super cool. Heck yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a yeah, it's a pretty like I don't know the technical terms, but it's like a pretty kind of rigid ride all the way through. Um, there's not a lot of like. I know this is not the accurate term. There is not a lot of noodliness to this bike. Like it's pretty, I don't know. Yeah, rigid. I think that's a perfect word for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I I don't know how you would describe noodly, but I think if you've ever been on a bike that feels noodly, you know it when you feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it's funny because last week, our our guest, uh, Cameron, uh, he had a lot of technical terms to use um so i kind of love that you know on the show we can talk super super nerdy in depth about like you know psi and welds and we can also talk about the feeling of a bicycle Mm -hmm. and noodles noodles or no noodles dry noodles or wet noodles really this is a very dry noodle and hopefully no noodles on your bicycle unless you want to feel noodly um Yeah, I could see how that could be useful in some situations, but not on gravel. Um, yeah. yeah. My mountain bike, so I have a, my second bike. This isn't directly related to your question, but my mountain bike is my mountain fat bike. I just, like, change my wheels out depending on the year or time of yes. year. And that one is, is like, very, very squirrely maybe would be another. Like, there's a lot of give in a lot of different places on that bike yeah. for that reason. And I was training – on that bike for most of my training for steamboat which as i mentioned i was like on greenways i don't know it's like not great on your body to be like trying to do endurance long distance like sprinting type training on a very squishy bike yeah because a lot of your energy goes into those parts and not necessarily into um your momentum of moving you forward um so definitely I guess to that end, since you did a lot of training on maybe your mountain bike, um, when you got onto your gravel bike, were you pleasantly surprised with how your body was feeling? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was, uh, like a totally different experience. Um, and I say this all the time, but it is so true. Like having the right tool for the right application for my body was like all three of those things instantly changed my experience. I was able to climb with much more efficiency. I was able to go longer without breaks. I like, I nerd out about this and also joke about it because the cranks that are on this bike are a very expensive set of cranks, which is like a little bit counter to a lot of the other kind of advocacy work that I try to do around cycling and inclusion and so to like have this bike that is pretty fancy and potentially inaccessible (laughs) but like I cannot describe to you how instantly I knew the quality of those cranks like there was no power loss in each of my pedals like it's I don't know it's wild so definitely like feeling the difference between the right tool for the discipline was incredible that first time. Well, and I think that's an important conversation in our space that we're creating here because all bodies are good bodies. All bikes are good bikes. All rides should be yeah. celebrated. And all you need to bike is a bicycle. Yeah. If you find that it is your joyful form of movement, there are steps you can take, can, not have to, to make it even more enjoyable for you. And so it's it's good to have these kinds of conversations. So again, People are, are, you know, bring your bike with the wheels falling off and we'll fix your wheels and go on a ride together. Uh, and then yeah. if you love it, we'll just slowly get you even more comfortable and happy to go out on a ride. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, that, that raises a really good point of there's a lot of us who are working towards inclusion um, who you mentioned this in Chingona, um, you know, you got sponsored with a bicycle and I'm in a similar boat. Um, to where I've been gifted a lot of things that I normally wouldn't be able to afford. And I think just having perspective on that and uh, not becoming elitist, like, oh, just because I have this $10,000 mountain bike doesn't make me any better than anybody else. Um, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to ride those bikes. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm still a dirtbag who likes to ride bikes and sleep outside and have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, let's talk about the film. Um, so yeah. it was just selected uh, for yeah. film by bike. So Ooh. congratulations. Thank you. Um, tell us about that. Um, what does that mean to you that people are going to see it? What are you hoping people take from the film? Yeah. Oh man. It means, it means a lot. It's a lot of like, there's the obvious kind of like recognition for hard work that went into just making that film. And um, speaking of previous guests, Cameron did a lot of that, like filming and editing. Um, so like joint project with someone who's very important to me is like also just like a really beautiful thing to put out into the world and to have it like received and celebrated is enormous um also just like how positive of a response it's gotten is huge because a lot of those things that I talked about were like a little uncomfy at first like a little nerve-wracking to share some of that vulnerability about like not feeling like I'm enough or like feeling like I don't belong on a bike sometimes and all of those like internal narratives that we have within ourselves that we don't often share just with the world like that so to hear so many messages of people who are really appreciative of it and like relate to it is also just um it's an honor and like yeah it makes me a little emotional sometimes and I'm just glad that sharing that can can have that impact for people um and like the other part of that is a like personal challenge for myself is challenging myself to engage in storytelling because I often I often just resort to like I don't know but my catchphrase I guess has been turning into like I'm just a potato like who am I why would anyone care about my story kind of is the attitude I've had for a really long time while at the same time knowing that representation was so important to me when I did start to see people who looked like me or other Chicanas or other biracial stories being told or even adoptee stories lately have been being told a lot. Like, I know how much it means to me to see myself. So why would I not engage in hopefully allowing other people to feel that in my story? So it's another like big kind of like thing that I've worked through to be comfortable to share my story in that way. Um, so I really like uh, kind of sharing with folks about that because I know there are so many people out there who are like, I don't know, no one's going to listen to my story or like, why would anyone read this or watch this? And like, it's so important for all of us to be able to do that. So that's one thing like that I would hope folks could get out of it. Um, yeah, there's also like planned extensions to that story, like Chingona as it is in the I guess it's the 2023 film by bike next year is um, Chingona One. And that really explores like personal healing and like healing with my body. Um, and then Chingona Two will be about that bike, pick bike packing trip that I mentioned in October with Steven, the frame builder. And that will really explore a lot of themes around like being an ally in BIPOC spaces and like really healing community through cycling and then the third one which is maybe a little top secret but I and mostly just because I like really want it to happen and I don't want to jinx it but Chingona 3 hopefully will follow uh the experience of going down to Mexico and connecting with my ancestral lands and like planning a backpacking trip down there so that really is like the healing of yeah, the healing of like culture, heritage, ancestry, um, specifically through land and the bicycle and like place in the bicycle, maybe I should say. So um, the goal really with Chingona as like a storytelling project is to explore how the bike connects these ways of healing and to just like have fun on a bike. I don't know. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I can't wait to see part two and part three. Um, you have this quote in Chingona One um, that I, I hope I got this right. But basically you say, you know, I was just me. I wasn't doing anything profound, but this journey wasn't and isn't about doing anything profound. This journey is about doing things with great love. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I just got goosebumps because I think it's so relatable. Um, you know, I often feel like I'm not doing anything profound. I'm just riding a bike as a fat woman. You know, you're just riding a bike. You're same thing with Maggie. We're all just doing it. 
but it is that great love that comes through. So can you tell us what is it about bicycles um, that makes you love them so much and makes you, we just lost Maggie. Goodbye, Maggie. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure she'll come back. Uh, Maybe her love for the bike was just too profound. Um, But, you know, what would you say to other folks? I'm literally crying, so I just stepped away for a second. Oh, no. Welcome back. Um, So, you know, what do you love about bicycles? And what would you say to other folks who question their ability to do profound things? Mm. Uh, I, man, there's a lot that I love about bicycles. And I think Chingona, that series of three kind of describes one of the main things that I love is that for me, anytime I'm on a bike, I'm healing something, whether it's a piece of like my relationship to my body, a piece of my relationship to the community that I've decided to be a part of here in Anchorage or the cycling community as a whole. Like there's a lot of healing that I personally have to do with that relationship to the cycling community. And um, so I I like that there's just all of these avenues for growth and intentionality and healing through it, if that's what you want to do. And like, for me, that is what I've chosen to do on a bicycle. Um, I also love that you can just like go on a bike ride with a friend and like chat about birds and flowers that are popping up and like, whatever, you know, it could be, it's this whole spectrum of, whatever you want the experience to be. Um, I also tend to be someone who really does well when I have like goals to work towards. And so cycling potentially as a hobby is something that I can like set goals towards and see myself really moving towards those goals, accomplishing those goals. Like I would have never imagined that I could bike into Denali. Like what? I set that goal. I worked hard and I did it. (laughs) And like that feeling of just, working towards those things. And again, it doesn't have to be like biking through Denali. It could be like biking to your local coffee shop is your goal. And once you do that, like that's so beautiful. It's so exciting and like such a good boost to to yourself. And yeah, I don't know. So I could keep going about why I love bikes, but also it's just fun to be outside in the world and in nature and in your like community. I've learned so much about where trails are in my town of Anchorage, just by biking um yeah and then to to talk about that second point around like feeling like we can't do profound things is like such a roadblock and it's like such a self-determined roadblock I think and it it comes down to like I don't this is such a hard like thing to balance oftentimes at least for myself if I'm getting caught up in like oh I can't do that like I can't achieve that because that's way too big that's too profound that's too important it's because I'm like taking it too seriously in mm, a, in a yeah. Way. yeah and then also there's this idea that like if you're doing something no matter how big or small if we're talking about scale like get rid of scale like why are you doing it? Why is it important to you? Like, is it bringing you joy? Are you like, do you love it? Is it like really deeply impacting you in a positive way? And like, that's the great love that you're pouring into it. And I think we sometimes don't take that seriously enough. Mm -hmm. So where is this balance? We're like, what is the impact that we're trying to have? Like, let's not take that too seriously, but what is the energy that we're pouring into it? Like, let's take that really seriously and just like deeply love ourselves and what we're doing at every point that we're doing it. And when we stop loving it, then just don't do it, if that makes sense. I don't know. I could, this is like such a hard balance (laughs) to, to achieve, but I think the great love, like what is the energy that I'm pouring into this thing? that's what motivates me and like keeps me doing things. And then hopefully the impact is what the impact needs to be. Yeah. A little bit of freedom and like letting go of what you expect the impact to be, but instead just doing something for joy and love. Yeah. And I think, you know, your work off the bike also relates to, um, how do I want to say this? Um, equality and storytelling and um, racial equality and re- racial equity. Um, can you talk more about that and how your work off the bike 
um, relates to your great love for things and then also back to bicycles? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, yeah, so I work at a nonprofit right now and I just recently started at this new nonprofit. So just broadly, like my background has always been around education and, um, but I've always approached that as like, I'm not the sole teacher in that experience. So I've just translated that to a lot of different scenarios. And now I work at this nonprofit that works to build uh, like people power and grassroots movement building around a just future for all, um, like working towards justice, but we apply an indigenized worldview. Um, so it's a native run organization. And so just like applying that same thought that shows up in the bicycle and shows up in my like work outside is I just love being in community with each other and learning from people and also teaching people um I even hesitate to say the word teaching but I don't know there's like knowledge exchange is what I've been um kind of referring to a lot of the work that I do now is like I approach scenarios where I may be the designated facilitator in a space but I'm not the only teacher in that space like we are all teachers and we're all learners and like that's where we get the most out of that scenario right so I think that 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 very much encapsulates the work that I do um and I and I do really focus on like racial equity types of things I'm now because of my brand new position with this org we're starting I'm starting to learn a lot more about how that is similar and ultimately very different from like decolonization work. So that's kind of where I'm heading in my professional life off the bike. Um, but the bike also has a lot to do with that. Um, there are a ton of people at my new org that um, that are biking and are using bikes for movement building, especially around like climate and environmental justice. Um, those are two of the branches in the work um, place. So anyways, it, it totally does all tie in. And then it also ties in because uh, one of the people on my team is also working with me outside of work to create those BIPOC affinity spaces that I mentioned earlier. Like um, we now work together both on the community education team at Native Movement. And then in our free time, we're developing these affinity spaces that um, that have just been really well received here in town. So. Yeah, it is all totally connected. I feel like I'm in this headspace of like equity and um, just like social justice, really, um, pretty much in everything that I do. And I like thinking about those tendrils. Just, it is so, so much just who I am. So, why do affinity spaces, why do we need them? Mm, oh gosh. Well, from my experience, one like example that I'll bring up a lot is, um, so I'm biracial, Chicana, Mexican-American, and there is going to be spaces in which I don't feel enough of either of those things. And I think that came up in Jingona a lot. Um, but in spaces where I'm with other bi or multiracial people, our experiences are so similar even across different racial makeups. So um, one example that I'll often bring up is that I've experienced spaces where I'll be with um, like Asian Americans that are half white and half Asian and their like lived experience around how we feel in our identity, like journey and connecting with our journey um, is so similar no matter what our racial makeup is. And so there's this like really beautiful thing that starts to happen where you can exist in these spaces where you don't necessarily have to describe every single detail or like put all these caveats to explaining your experience um, when you're in a space where that shared experience is kind of just like unspoken. You can get to some of these deeper, meatier things. You can start talking about what do we want the future to look like? What is the impact of feeling like I'm not Mexican enough? Like how does that relate to how I show up in spaces, any space really? So I think that's like my example of why affinity spaces are so important to me is that it allows this kind of filter or one filter to kind of be taken off for a little bit. I don't think that affinity spaces only are the solution, but they're definitely like so important and like such a relief 
um, they're a space of relief and a space of healing so that we can come back to do a lot of the harder work where we're working across racial identities or trying to, ex you know, understand the experience of indigenous people in this country. I will never understand that, but the more that I have those healing and joyful spaces around folks that innately understand me without explanation, then the more energized I am to show up for the hard work where I also am questioning my own biases. I'm also questioning all of these things I've learned. I'm unlearning so much all the time. That's one thing that isn't directly related to the question, but just to say that like, just because I facilitate these spaces and I'm doing this work all the time doesn't mean that I'm an expert in it. Like I am unlearning <laughs> and unpacking and relearning all the time, like constantly. So um, I think that's also where if we want to bring back great love again is this requires great love. Like I have to really love this work in order to do it all the time because I'm doing it with other people. I'm facilitating it for other people, but I'm also constantly facilitating it for myself. Um, so I think I got off on a little bit of a tangent there with the direct question, but yeah. <laughs> it was a beautiful tangent. And I think yeah. you bring up a really good point of when this work does become all consuming, you have to have great love for yourself too. And great compassion. Um, mm. because I think you mentioned this in Chingona, but like, sometimes you just don't feel like you're enough and, um, yeah. that's okay sometimes. Yeah, Totally show up for the work like wherever you are now and the, it's like funny this is another tension thing where like we can feel like we're not enough and that's okay and it like I don't want to minimize or tell anyone not to feel that way because it's such a real feeling and also we are always enough exactly as we are because we're showing up and we're like putting the effort in and because we care so yeah both of those things are true at the same time I always say, cause we're taught so much that like, this is, this is the one thing. And I'm, I always talk about two true things, mm -hmm. two true things, because it's not, it's so much stuff is not one true thing. Um, so I, I appreciate yeah. that you like create the space to not feel like you're enough because sometimes trying to just shove that aside is 10 times as hurtful as just making space to, okay today you don't feel like enough. Yeah. I'm just going to sit beside you while you feel that way and tell you that you are because you're, you are, but yeah. you feel however you need to. I'm going to believe yeah. it until you do. Yeah. Yeah. And also like make friends with that feeling so that when it comes back, you're not again, like immediately brushing it to the side or putting it in the closet or like hiding it under the bed. Like you're going to feel that so many times, no matter how much work you're doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, and is mm -hmm. something that I like say a lot in my facilitations where people are like, well, isn't this thing true? Like, yes. And here's this other thing that is simultaneously just as true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Totally. I don't have a lot to add right now, except that I'm just like taking this all in because this is exactly what I need to be hearing right now. Um, yeah. I, I often well, lately have been feeling this way. Um, so it's it's just such a beautiful reminder that wherever we're at, it is enough and it's it's going to be okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. Breathe, breathe into yourself a little bit. I did have one, um, man, one thing that came up to just in listening to what Maggie was saying of like a lot of, a lot of when I feel like I'm not enough, it's because I feel like I cannot solve the problem. I cannot mm. do the thing, whatever it is, in that moment. And this is where I may get a little bit more technical than like talking about bikes, but principles of like racial equity work and facilitation and like just naming something here is like, I think a lot about white supremacy and, and how we can interrogate that. And like one of the characteristics that I've come to learn that is like really present in white supremacy is this idea of individualism and that like, I have to take care of myself and I'm not successful unless I'm the one doing X, Y, and Z. And like, there's just such that mentality of like, I have to take care of myself and I have to be the best that I can be alone and like prove myself kind of and that attitude 
is just so challenging to get away from since we're raised in it so much. And I don't know, especially for me as a woman, like I feel that even stronger because I'm like, I want to be the strong, independent woman that like, you know, I want to be a chingona. <laughs> but part of what I've thought previously would make me a chingona was this idea that I had to like do everything by myself. When in reality, like one of the best ways to directly combat white supremacy is to say like, I don't have to do this alone. I do this in community with others. And like one day I'm going to be a sad puddle on my bed and I'm going to be sobbing and I can't show up for the work, but I trust that Maggie and Marley can show up for the work that day. And like, they're going to take a little bit of the load that day. And like one day Marley's going to be crying <laughs> on your bed and like, that's fine. And I hopefully step back up, right? Like we all working together and spreading out that like, labor is so important and it is like it seems like such a small thing but to name that it is a direct opposition to one of the things that is so present in white supremacy culture is like really important um so that's just one thing that i'll toss out about like how i approach racial equity work is like how do we do this in community all the time so that i'm not so on the days that i don't feel like enough and maggie's sitting next to me on the bench like, it's okay, the work still happens, and I can take a day, or I can take a week, I can take a month off <laughs> if I need to. Um, so anyways, that's one last thought, is to just name that as, like, a direct opposition to one of the main systems of white supremacy. Um, so anyways. So powerful. And it just makes me think that I myself have so much unlearning to do, and so much, um, I don't even know how to say it, but like, built in white supremacy that I've I haven't challenged and I have just accepted that this is the way it is like just like you're saying you know taking the work on by ourselves I I'm in a deep hole right now mentally and mm. emotionally and realizing that like no I do have friends that I can call on for this and I have a community of people and yeah uh, thank you of course call I'm gonna make time <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm really far away but <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, in today's world, uh, you're just a phone call away. That's true. Just a Zoom, you can see my face. That's so yeah. true. We're all in it together for sure. And whether it's racial equity or like size inclusion or any type of inclusion, especially in cycling, that I know that you both are working so hard towards, like it's a lot of work give yourselves the grace that we give other people, right? We give so many people and things so much grace and we rarely give it to ourselves. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, this conversation yeah. went somewhere I wasn't expecting. No. <laughs> All right. Anybody's keeping score at home, two for three on the crying. <laughs> I think that's Sorry. a first for our podcast. <laughs> wow. I, Congratulations. I Thanks. Sometimes crying is really good. I like oh, 100%. crying, so I'm taking this as a good thing. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, I love crying, too. Actually, yesterday, the entire plane ride home from Denver, I, like, mm. couldn't stop crying. Uh, <laughs> but I, like, couldn't identify where it was coming from. I just yeah. was just, like, upset. Um, and I think it was because, you know, I just, like, kind of put a name to these feelings that I was having or not having, as the case might be. Um, yeah. And it was just this recognition that, like, I have now asked for help and that's the first step towards getting better. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Man. But today's episode is not about me. Things. Like, <laughs> no, but it's related. Like yeah. that step of naming, like you've named the feeling and you've named where you're at and that can be really scary. Um, and I just, I think that's so important for all aspects of the work that the three of us are trying to do. It's just naming things is really the hardest, but it's the first step. Yeah. definitely i'm proud of you um, thank you yeah of course yeah um so you recently went on a trip to the well, i guess it wasn't that recent but to the east coast and you went mm -hmm. bikepacking with uh how do you say it is it s wood or swood it's or wood because it's stephen wood is his name <laughs> Okay, with with Swood Cycles. Uh, tell us, you know, what that was like. Um, yeah. Tell us about your work with Seven Roads Bags, um, oh the Philly Bike Expo. 
Let's hear about it. It's a three for three for crying. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh, man. (laughs) So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, So, in October, I was going to be in North Carolina anyways for a wedding. And so, um, Cameron and I decided to do my first multi-night bikepacking trip. I had done lots of, like, one-nighters. Um, and as a part of this whole process, Stephen got kind of looped in. Um, I recently told this story in front of a big audience in like one of those uh, storytelling events where you have seven minutes. So I've kind of like practiced parts of this. So try not to be too scripted, but Stephen and I like really did not talk a lot during the bike build. We would like heart each other's things on our Instagram stories and that's pretty much it. So when Cameron was like, Steven's joining our bikepacking trip, I was like, uh, (laughs) it's me because I get really nervous biking with groups. And this is a stranger. This is a strange white man, I might add. And I don't know how I'm going to feel on a bikepacking trip on my anti-racism mobile, as I call it. It's got a sticker that says fuck racism on it. And like, you know, I'm going to a new place and there's this new person who's at least cool enough to donate a bike but other than that like I really don't know this person I don't know where he stands on knowledge of racial equity or like knowledge of queer inclusion even like it goes all across my identities right so anyways we Stephen ends up being and is just one of the most sweet sweet humans um But I love reflecting on our friendship because I think that, in my opinion, it, like, was a slow start to that friendship that got really deep quickly at a certain point. So the entire first day of our trip was, like, yeah, that kind of slow burn, like, feeling each other's humor out. Turns out that he likes to say things weird, which is also something that I like to do. So we called, the route that we were on is called the Croatan uh, wow, gravel vanish is what it's actually called, but we started calling it the garvel varnish. Um, so this is like little tidbits of like, okay, yeah, like I can get along with Steven. And, but it's still like very service level this entire first day. Um, and just like small tidbit, because people love hearing about this, is that that first day I ended up essentially breaking my foot. We didn't find out about what the actual injury was until much later, but I fell hurt my foot really bad. Steven was obsessed with telling this story about how my foot just swole up and you could see the heartbeat in my foot, which is a, and it's a, a hyperbole, a hyperbole. Is that how you say it? Um, it swelled up really, swelled really bad that first night. But um, anyway, so that like added this layer of like, oh my God, now I'm injured. I'm gonna, and then I would have been crying anyways on this big adventure. But now I'm for sure going to cry at least a couple times and I'm still with the stranger. But um, really, like, the thing that made me have a deep, deep appreciation for Stephen is a conversation that we had around campfire. And this whole trip is being documented with, like, photos and videos. Cameron's there. Like, obviously, there's a high degree of digital, like, tracking on this trip. And because Chingona, too, is is going to eventually uh, come out. Um, But there's a moment where like no cameras, Cameron's off getting water. It's just Steven and I and talking about the complexities of what inspired him to donate a bike build to a stranger. And essentially in my mind, like to a racial equity project, (laughs) like this was a bike meant for me to race in Steamboat with Ride for Racial Justice. Like I said, it's got a sticker on it that says fuck racism. I'll get to the Seven Roads back because that's a super important part of this narrative too. Um, All of it is this like racial equity lens to this bike. It's also a bike that I love to ride, but it is like a statement too. So I was like, what, like what motivated you? Like what got you into this project? And the like, such clear transparency there around um, just so many complex things and I think I there's complexities around storytelling here too of like when does storytelling who does storytelling serve right like we talked a little bit about how awkward it can feel sometimes to talk about my bike or 
my story on social media because I'm not trying to monetize it. I'm not trying to like benefit even further, but it's also super important for people to relate to and hear and like, um, so yeah, we just had this like incredible conversation around like what, when you do things because you love it, that was a huge thing. He just loves building bikes. And that comes through so clearly when you like see him in his garage or like see him talking about the bike that he's built or like some of these details. So he did something because he loved it because it was the right thing. And because it was really like cool to be invited to a project as a small business and like all of those things don't negate the other thing. And there's like these tensions between when is altruism real? Like, is altruism ever real? And can we do things that are altruistic and still benefit from them? And not that Stephen only did it to benefit. I don't think that I would ever say that. But yeah, just like we just had such a good conversations about all those tensions, right? It's like the yes and. Like, the his willingness to engage with this stranger on night one of the campfire in the yes and, in the like complicating things was so refreshing and um yeah it was just really beautiful so I think there's something magical that happens after you've been riding together doing hard things and then you you know eat a meal together or sit around a campfire you get to conversations that you wouldn't be able to if you were just talking in person right yeah totally like it changes yeah yeah so that was just really beautiful and we became really good friends like deep deep appreciation um I haven't really talked to him too much since you know again we kind of go back to like interacting with each other's stories on Instagram but um like yeah that profound appreciation for him will never change no matter like if we don't talk for a whole nother year so um I love friendships like that like yeah. I love deep friendships but I also love those that you can just pick up when you haven't seen each other for a year and it's the same. Yeah. And I know that I'll support him and he supports me. And one thing that I'll say just um, about the bags, because you specifically brought it up, it's such a beautiful part of the project and the story. And Maggie was here for this, <laughs> for this journey. So the, the whole set of bags on this bike uh, was donated by a company called Seven Roads or 7R on Instagram and they are based in Ukraine and throughout this bike build they like this is all told through so again Cameron did a lot of the coordinating on the details of this project so this is my like repeating of what he has told me but in the midst of moving their factory because they were in a war zone in Ukraine they looked up what Ride for Racial Justice was, what Black Lives Matter is, like what this fight for racial equity is in America. And in like learning, essentially said, and again, I wasn't privy to this conversation, but essentially said like, it's not the same at all, but it feels similar to how we're being prosecuted in our country right now. And we wanna be a part of this. So like I I get chills every time this is the part where like I sometimes really just want to sit in a puddle and sob because this and they're like run by I think just three folks and they do so much good work um their, their bags are incredible aside from everything else that went into that like the bag is just incredible it's um yeah, and so they screen printed, I don't know if it's screen printed, but on all of the bags, it, one of them says Black Lives Matter, one of them says fuck racism, but the S is actually a Z because of translation things, and so it's <laughs> racism, <laughs> and uh, it says ride for the racial justice, and I just love it because it's this like beautiful, tangible example of like relating to a struggle and relating to a fight, and just hopping right on board and like supporting it and since then there's and I don't I don't know anything about this except that I've just seen it on Instagram since then other people who have gotten their bags have also put like the ride for racial justice logo on it or fuck racism or black lives matter and it's just like such an honor that this company now is supporting this this movement here and people from all over the world are like yeah I want a bag that says fuck racism or 
or Black Lives Matter on it, like, of course. So just really, really beautiful story. And like, another example of I feel like I'm friends with those folks. We've only interacted on Instagram. I've only like, posted and tagged them and been like, thank you so much. Um, but I really do feel like a friendship and kinship with them. And the funniness of the story of just like getting them on the bike with Maggie is <laughs> that they landed, they arrived in Alaska probably an hour after I had gotten to the airport to fly to North Carolina. Oh so no. They arrive at my doorstep. We get a delivery confirmation. We're like, uh, we're like in the airport. Our bike is packed into the plane. Like, what are we going to do? So we, two different people in Alaska worked together to retrieve the package from my house to reroute it to Maggie's address in North Carolina, <laughs> get it to the post office. Just, you know, we're like calling while I'm getting my nails done because I was a bridesmaid. So I was like in the nail salon, like trying to figure out where to send this package. Maggie receives said package and meets Cameron and I in Boone, Boone, North Carolina, and hands over the bags. And so Maggie was there the first time I saw them. And I cried in a Walgreens parking lot for sure. <laughs> they're just so beautiful they're like they are. beautiful tangibly and they're beautiful just because of what they mean and like yeah. the story and like it took and then yeah I mean geez I can be symbolic all day and just say like it took a whole community to even get them into my hands for that first ride like just beautiful anyways yeah I love those bags <laughs> that is so so cool and it just makes me think that you know how many stories we all have built into all the things that we do and you know yeah. a bike isn't just a bike a bag isn't just a bag um a ride usually isn't just a ride you know yeah. using it to heal or to process or to have fun or to love ourselves um I think you've brought up some really really good points and I'm just so honored to have you on the show Oh, thank you. Um, is meowing to say hello, sorry. Oh, hello, kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, with that beautiful story, it's a really good place to to end. But before we do, we have two questions that we ask every guest. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, what is your perfect day on a bike? Mm, oh, my gosh. Sunny, but like 65 to 70 degrees. Uh, not too hot and lots of snacks potentially fun beverages Ooh. Lots of stops for like pictures and just chats and yeah yeah what's your favorite bike snack this is not an official question but oh. it has to be asked it has to be <laughs> yeah asked for it does sure. have to be asked um <laughs> I have been riding with either small tubes or like big tubes of Jif peanut butter um and just like squeeze it right oh my god I'm so sorry <laughs> squeeze it right into my mouth when I'm tired um that's a good snack and then also just anything chocolate mm, yes little, little nuggets of chocolate <laughs> I support both those things yeah and then our second question that we always ask at the end is what is something you wish you got to talk about more oh my gosh um Oh, this is hard. I want to talk more about the individual small things that we can all be doing to increase equity in cycling. And uh, I don't need to be the person speaking the most words about that, but I want to talk to people about that more. Yeah. So. Hey, Maggie, I heard something really exciting is happening next week. Is Is that true? You know, I actually heard that as well. I, I heard a little bird, a little bird told me that on March the 28th. That's Tuesday. That's a Tuesday uh, at the National Bike Summit in what? Washington, D.C., right? You know, just <laughs> super casual. Um, if you go to the, the D.C. REI, uh, there's going to be this really cool thing. These two really fantastic female cyclists uh, are going to be hosting a live podcast recording. Shut up. That's Anna. what I heard. I know, right? Uh, have you heard about the, like, the, I think it's called the All Bodies on Bikes podcast? Oh, you silly goose. That's us. Oh, my goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> but yeah. Yes. It's true. Yeah, if you're going to be there, come hang out with us. We're going to do a live podcast recording. Yeah. And we've got some really exciting guests lined up. Um, yes, we do. 
it was going to be just me and Maggie talking, but we decided to spice it up a little bit. <laughs> and we've got some folks coming from, um, what's the name of the organization? It's like I, the D- DC the, Tandem folks. Yep. Something like that. We will have these details figured out before <laughs> the recording next week. Yes. Um, but basically it's an organization that helps folks with visual impairments uh, ride tandem bicycles. So the captain is often sighted. The stoker is the blind one. Um, and we're going to have them on the show to talk about how that works. Oh, yeah. um, That's going to be and awesome. Probably just some fun back and forth banter. Um, yep. So if you're in the DC area, please feel free to come join us. Um, it is open to the public and it'll be at the DC flagship REI store at 7 p.m. We hope to see you there. Yeah, it's going to be great. The end. The end of story. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> well, this has been another amazing episode of the All Bodies on Bikes podcast yes, uh, with has. our guest, Olivia Frankie. Um, if folks want to watch Chingona or catch up with what you're up to, where can they find you? Yeah, find me on Instagram is going to be best, uh, at Olivia Frankie. Olivia has... I'll just spell it O L I V I A H F R A N K E. Um, that's where I do most of my storytelling. Chingona lives on Renaissance Cyclists YouTube. That's Cameron Sanders. So if you look up YouTube, Renaissance Cyclist Chingona, and you'll find it. Awesome. And we will have links to all of that, um, plus a link to S Wood or swood cycling um seven road bags um we'll have links to lots of the different things that we talked about um so olivia thank you again for your time and i hope you get a chance to go enjoy some of that alaska sunshine that is peeking through your window right now (laughs) yeah thank you so much for having me it was really good to see and talk to both of you today agreed all right talk to you later This is an All Bodies on Bikes podcast powered by Feisty Media. The show is produced by Maggie and Marley and edited by the team at Feisty Media. Thanks for listening.